Good evening, Wednesday Night Bible Study. We missed last week. I was out fishing. I'm not going to lie. That's what I was doing. It's okay. I think that's allowed to be doing. Jesus fished, right? Uh, I can be really relevant here and talk about how I was fishing for men or something, but no, I was fishing for tarpon. I didn't catch any. I didn't even see any. So uh, this week should be better, but uh, we'll see if I actually make it out. Uh, Matthew chapter number 6, uh, we're going through the Sermon on the Mount. We talked about last week that externalism of rebuke. That is the kind of concept of trying to make yourself appear uh, something that you're not, right? Trying to have an ulterior motive in your actions to make people look at you and go, ooh, look what he did. Wow, that's impressive. And obviously God doesn't like that, right? He's not interested in that. He's looking for what? He's looking for a pure motivation with a pure heart. And we talked about how the, the foolish things uh, God uses to bring to not the things that are, right? So he takes things like the crucifixion and people would say, well, that's, that sounds like a really foolish and dumb thing that somebody would die and somehow through that death, he would then be raised again and you'd get justification. Well, it's it's foolishness to them that what? To them that perish, right? But to thus, them who are saved, it is what? It's the power of God into salvation. You wonder, you go, well, why do some people think it's the power of God and some people think it's not? You know what it really comes down to? It comes down to whether or not you've, you've been convinced of the truth. Have you been convinced of the truth or have you not? If you've been convinced of the truth, then you think it's the power of God. If you've not been convinced of the truth, you believe the lie of Satan and think it's foolishness, right? Well, clearly Satan doesn't think it's foolishness because he's trying really hard to prevent people from believing it, right? So if you look at the book of uh, 2 Peter for a second, I wanted to kind of talk to you about this just for a second. He says this, in verse number 11, he says, For so an entrance, Second Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 11, Peter writes, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you, what? Abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we talked about how there is a reward-based system and that these people are looking for that reward-based system, right? They're looking at that reward-based system as what? As the incentivization for what? For their, for their action, for their, for their obedience. And you say, well, is that really what Christ is talking about in Matthew chapter 5? Yes. He says, look, if you go out and you break one of these least commandments, right? You're going to be called what? You'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But if you go and you teach others, right? You'll be called what? You'll be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So you can see that there's a least versus a great, and that's pretty obvious in a kingdom type of hierarchy, right? Who, who, who do you have as the top? You have the king. And then below that, who do you have? Well, the king appoints rulers, does he not? He appoints people to help out of the provinces. Does that really occur? Well, yeah, even look at Rome during the days of Christ. You know, you can't have just one guy running all of the Roman Empire, you know? You have guys who are running little provinces and little countries and little areas, and they're set aside. And you, who do you pick to do that, that rulership? Well, you pick the guy that knows what he's doing, right? It's just the same thing. Like Dick, I can't really say this you know, over the last couple of years, but you usually try to pick the president or pick the leader, right? Who, who knows what's going on? Who's going to make the right decisions and make the right choices? More so today, the president is about externalism, right? It's about trying to make you think that he's going to make the right decisions. So this reward or this entrance that shall be ministered unto you, who gives these rewards? If it's ministered unto you, you're not ministered to yourself. It's ministered unto you abundantly, and it's done so by who? Well, read Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 18. He says that thou appear not to men to fast, but unto thy father, which is in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret shall reward thee how shall reward thee openly so during the abundant entry into the kingdom is this something that other people will see well of course right and not only that you're you're gonna get a title right you're, you're gonna get either a a, a a a promotion or a demotion when you're in the kingdom Oh, sorry, you're demoted and the joke I used to always give was well there's gonna be somebody that's gonna clean up the horse poop you know, somebody's got to do it. I mean, realistically, somebody's got to do that job. So what's going to happen? Would you rather be a ruler over 10 or 20? Remember, we went through some of those verses in the, in the book of Luke and in Matthew. We talked about if you're, the, the more that you're faithful, you know, that, that what happens? Paul talks about it in, uh, go, go back over to the book of Corinthians for a second. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number uh 
1, and I'm going to read you these verses, and then I'm going to talk about this faithfulness issue, and then we'll, we'll tie it in with, with what's happening here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says this, he says, uh, verse number 27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. The foolish things, the main foolish thing is what? It's the preaching of the cross, right? It's the gospel. If you were to go out and you were to go preach the gospel to most people, they would think, what? That sounds ridiculous. I talked to a girl this week at, at an office, and we were sitting there, and uh, she she has a little cross on her neck, you know, and it has a little, like, like a, it's an empty cross, right? So you're like, okay, so she's not Catholic. There's something, you know, something there. So I kind of let in with some stuff, and I said, uh, you know, yeah, t- tell me a little about, you know, you got that cross, you got some other stuff. She's like, yeah, yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of went to church growing up. I said, where'd you go to church? Oh, I went to, you know, a couple different churches, Indian Rocks. I said, oh, Indian Rocks, okay, yeah. I, I've, I used to go there for a little while. Where else have you been to church? I went to Bridgepoint for a while. Okay, Bridgepoint, yeah, you know uh, my buddy Kenny. Yeah, yeah, I know Kenny, yeah, okay. So, we, you know, we went back and forth, talked about it for a little bit. I said, well, what's your problem? She goes, I just feel like all those places, you know, eh, you know, what's really going on? What are they really doing? You know, I was like, well, what do you mean? I just don't think they're, none of them really preaching the Bible. It's like, interesting. So I started talking to her, right? So I started kind of peeling back the onion, seeing what she had to, had to say, and uh, kind of talked to her about, you know, my experience with, with the Bible and with reading it and how most people haven't ever studied it. But uh, she, she said, well, where do you go to church? I said, oh, we, we go to a small little church. It's called Sunco's Bible. It's very small, you know, less than 100 people. We'd be lucky to get 50 on a, on a great Sunday, you know. It's, it's not a whole lot of people that are showing up there. Uh, but I can tell you that, you know, we, we try to be diligent in, our, in, in being studious of the Word of God, not just for the sake of being studious, but if the Bible is actually the Word of God, it is, a, it is our, our, our uh, you know, kind of pinnacle of instruction that we should follow and not just a willy-nilly approach, but, you know, again, an approach that takes into consideration uh, dispensations or takes into consideration context and that type of thing. She's like, oh, that sounds really good. I, she goes, well, tell me a little more about your service. I said, well, we sit at a table. <laughs> she goes, so it's more like a Bible study. I said, yeah, we sit at a table. We, we, we definitely, we don't have any music. Not that we have anything wrong with it. We just don't have any music. We just get in and we preach the word for an hour or two and we go home, you know, and that's kind of what, what happens. She goes, that sounds like what I really want to really want to want to see i mean how weird is that for somebody to be like you know what i'm saying like most people are like oh weird you know i want to i want to get involved in a you know how's your uh, what style my other friend just asked me today he's like oh, what's your church like what, what's the uh what style is it what style is it um i don't know it's got a bowl cut uh wears plaid pants I, what do you mean i don't what, what style is it? I don't, I don't get what you mean uh it's metro i, I don't know he's talking about like the, the style of worship you know he thinks of it as, is it a contemporary church? Is it a liberal church? Is it really a conservative church? Is it a fundamental church? You know, I'm like, yeah, it's none of those really. You know, it's, 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 that's, that's, a, that's another label that requires what? What do labels always require? Definition, right? So you can give, put a label on something, you got to define it. So I told this girl, she says, well, do you have anything I can listen to? I said, oh yeah, only a couple hundred sermons online. So I uh, I gave her the link to Sunco's Bible and I told her, and I work with this person a lot, right? I mean, like a lot, a lot, right? And uh, it's one of my bigger clients and well, hopefully they're still my client because <laughs> you never know, you know, somebody might hear somebody say something and they're like, well, I can't believe you called the Jews a synagogue of Satan or, you know, something like that. It's like, well, hold on, hold on. You know, that's, that's, you have to, you have to listen to everything that we're talking about here. You know, our, our goal is honesty and transparency in the study of scripture, really, right? It's, it's really about that honesty and, and, and taking things and, and not just going like, man, how can this help you? I, I, I do listen, as I told you before, I listen to other churches in the area. When I'm driving around, I pull up their sermons and I listen to them. And the reason why I do that is because I think it's, it's out of fairness, right? If I'm going to mention something about that church, it's been a while since I've been there or I've visited that I need to make sure that what's going on is the same thing that happened when I left. And I, I, I listened to some churches recently, Bridgepoint being one of them, and their Easter sermon was entitled Wrecked. And uh, it was uh, pretty interesting, pretty interesting uh, sermon. Um, but either way, they try to do it. They try to usually fancy up the gospel, they try to keep it, you know, let's, let's try to really just bring it back to what it is. It's called the offense of the cross for a reason, right? It is, it is offensive, right? You're gonna, you're gonna offend people. It's gonna happen, you know. Paul says, you know, has the offense of the cross ceased? You know, no, of course not, right? I'm still suffering. That's the reason why. 
So in Matthew chapter number six, and you know, I, I think many people have read this and they go, well, I'm looking for God to reward me openly. So going back over to you know, 1 Corinthians chapter number one, he says, for God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and these things are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. It's a great verse. You should mark that, right? No flesh should glory in his presence. None, not at all. That's, that, that whole concept of no flesh should glory in his presence, if you're going to have an abundant entry into the kingdom, you know, it's not because of what your flesh did. It's because of what Christ did through your flesh, right? So if you look, um, I'll just give you the verse off the top of my head, you know, Romans chapter number four, it says, uh, you know, what shall we say as pertaining Abraham? You know, according to the flesh hath found, right? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, right? But not before God, right? So what I'm trying to show you is that God looks at things in a completely different way, right? When Paul says that in Romans chapter four, verse one, what shall we say then as pertaining to the flesh? Abraham, our father hath found, right? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but what? But not before God. We know that because no flesh is going to glory before God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right? So there's nothing you're going to be able to do to say, Ooh, God, look at me. He says, but he, Paul says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, really good, and righteousness, terrific, and sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now, I like how Paul says in verse number two, he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, right? It's not necessary that you wax philosophical. It's not necessary that you talk about science and the law and you be very detailed. Sure, some people, is that helpful to them? Yes, but you want to be careful that what you do is you do what Paul says here. He says, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you. He says, I didn't, I didn't care to learn anything about you. I, didn't, I already knew the state you were in. I didn't need you to tell me. So I preach to you what you need. That is Jesus Christ and him crucified. So in that phrase, what, do we, what is implied? What's implicit there? His, the reason for his death, right? So clearly what would, what would have to be talked about? Sin, right? It's going to come up. It's going to be there. And he says this, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but a demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul goes on later on in Romans chapter number, or 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 1, he, he reads this, and we'll jump back over to Matthew chapter uh, 6. He says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that what? That a man be found faithful. See, the ministry that they're going to have here in Matthew chapter number uh, 6 is what? What is really their ministry? It's to be an example, right? Can I give you the parallel passage? Most of you guys aren't familiar with this parallel passage. Maybe some of you are. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number four just for a moment. This is the parallel passage to show you their responsibility, right? What should the Jews do? Well, the Jews should do this. Let your light, Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify who? You? No. Glorify who? Glorify your Father, which is in heaven, right? Let no flesh glory. Deuteronomy chapter number 4 talks about the law in verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. And in verse number 5, it says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land, whether you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your, what? Wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. They have an instruction that the other nations do not have in which they are to do what? They are to instruct the other nations, right? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, right? What are you going to teach them? What are you going to teach them? Oh, we're going to teach them Christianity. Really? That's interesting. Tell me more, right? Tell me more about how you're going to teach Christianity. Stopping at that verse and reading nothing else and going back. 
teach me Christianity, right? The concept of Christianity is not found. That, 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 that purview of, 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 a, of, a, of a oneness in the body of Christ is not seen because in that exact phrase, go ye into all the world and teach the gospel, somebody has something that the others don't, right? So it puts them and says, hey, we have the responsibility, moreover in stewards, it is required that a man be found faithful, so as stewards of the gospel of the kingdom, they are required to be faithful in going out and delivering that message to the world. Did they do so? No, right? So he says here, keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall do what? Of course they're going to hear about all these statutes, and they're going to say, surely this is a great nation as a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? Clearly a separational issue that exists all the way up into Matthew chapter number 6, right? God came down and visited who? He came to who? He came to the Jews. Now let me show you a verse. Hold your place in Deuteronomy 4. I want to show you this because it's really important. Luke, Luke chapter number 1. This, is, this kind of segues this together here. Read Luke chapter number one. And let me give you this. Luke chapter one and verse number. 15. For he shall be great. This is talking about John the Baptist. For he shall be great in the sight of of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord prepared to do what? Go ye into all the world and teach all nations. Teach them what? I mean, I keep asking you that question, but I'm waiting for somebody to answer the question. What are you going to teach them? Well, the scripture says, teaching them whatsoever I have commanded you. People say, oh, see, that's not the law. That's not commandments. Well, I'm pretty sure it's exactly what it is. Because he says, whatsoever I have commanded you. That's a commandment. If you don't believe me? I'll turn back to Matthew chapter 28 for a minute. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, Matthew 28, 19, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. I'm just going to give you one verse, okay? Just, 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 just like, uh, it's kind of like a warhead. Remember what warheads are like? Remember warheads? The warheads are those little like candies and you stick them in your mouth. I got in trouble. I gave one of my 90-year-old second grade Bible teacher at Sunday school one day and she about had a heart attack and I gave her a lemon warhead and she was like, oh, and she spit it out and she's going, oh. I remember it was really bad and then I got sent out of the room and then they told my parents afterwards. It's pretty funny. But I said, do you want one of these candies? And she said, sure. And so I, I took it out of the package, of course, and I gave it, I put it in like a little container or something and I handed it to her. So let me give you a verse to think about just for a second, okay? Keep your place in Deuteronomy 4. Hold your place in Matthew 6. Hold your place in Matthew 28. And then I want to get you to, to 1 Corinthians chapter number uh, uh, 1 and 2. Look at look at this here. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 17. I just, I just want you to think about this for a second, okay? I'm not going to preach on this. This isn't what I'm preaching on. This is an aside. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 17. Paul says this. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Just, just want you to think about that for a second. Go home and as a warhead, take that and stick it in your mouth. At first, what is it going to do? You can be like, what, what is this? Ah, this is horrible. You know, this is this is what was said. This is, he doesn't mean that. He means something else. He means something like this. Or you know, you're gonna you might get offended. But after you sit there and you suck on it for a little bit, what happens? 
eventually it'll become sweet, tastes good, right? And you're like, oh, okay. I see what he's saying. Study that passage out because if you read Matthew 28 and he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, let me ask you a question. Is that a command? It's definitely a command. Why? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. He commanded you to do that. Meaning the people who were there at that time, right? He commanded the apostles. So as you can see here, yes. How do we reconcile? For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Well, it's good. It's a good. It's a good question. It's, it's pretty actually easily reconcilable, and we'll leave that for another day. But I want you to think about it as we go through these next couple of verses. He says, Deuteronomy chapter number six, verse number seven. For what nation is there so great? They're a great nation. And, and, and who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? Why are they saying that? Turn with me to Psalm chapter 147. Read verse number 12. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise thy God, O Zion. This is Psalm 147, 12, verse 13. For he hath strengthened the bars of thy gates. He hath blessed thy children within thee. He maketh peace in thy borders and fillest thee with the finest of the wheat. He sendeth forth his commandment upon the earth. His word runneth very swiftly. He giveth snow like wool. He scattereth the hoar frost like ashes he casteth forth his ice like morsels who can stand before his cold he sendeth out his word and melteth them he causeth his wind to blow and the waters flow he showeth his word unto jacob his statutes and his judgments unto israel remember that's what he said behold i have taught you the statutes and the judgments deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 5 he showeth his word unto jacob his statutes and his judgments unto israel he hath not dealt so with any nation read that again he hath not dealt so with any nation what is he trying to do there's a verse and there's several of them he talks about a light to lighten the gentiles remember that passage a light to lighten the Gentiles. Turn with me to, to Romans chapter number 2. That's another good verse on this. What I'm showing you is these people's, these people's reward is, is based upon something interesting here. Look at, look at uh, Romans chapter 2 and verse number 17. He says, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. Right? Well, yeah. Who's he comparing them to? Behold, thou art called a Jew. If you were a Gentile, what would you say? You don't rest in the law. You don't make thy boast of God. You don't know his will. You definitely don't approve the things that are more excellent, and you're definitely not instructed out of the law. Right? He says, And art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dost honorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. Now I want you to, now I want you, I'm going to bring this full circle here. Back in Deuteronomy chapter number 4, they're all going, What nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law is which I set before you this day? Look at that middle wall of partition. Look what it's doing in this separation. Look at these guys and what they're doing. And all of a sudden, what do you read here? You read, Hey, thou therefore was teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? See, if you're going to go out and teach all nations, you better be doing what you're telling people to do, Right? Right? Yeah. And if you don't, what is that prime example of? Well, it's a prime example of what's taking place in Matthew chapter number 6. It, it, it's, it, it's called being a hypocrite. It's about going, hey, um, moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sound, sad countenance. 
for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face. Make it look, make yourself look better when you're fasting than even when you weren't fasting, so people would never even have an inkling of an idea that you're fasting. Why? That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. See, the incentive for the obedience is to walk by faith, right? In the word, believing what he says, so that ultimately, what do you get? You have an incentive for doing it. It's not like, we're just going to do this and that's it. We just do it because they say so. No, it's so much easier, especially with my little three-year-old, it's so much easier to incentivize his obedience, right? Dude, if you're really good, I promise we'll stop by Dairy Queen and get you a blizzard. Hey, it works. If you're really good, I'll let you buy a new app on your iPad. If you're good, you'll get a toy right? Rewards are not bad. Rewards are great. We want to incentivize rewards. Even today, we should incentivize the reward-based program that God has laid out for the body of Christ. There's definitely a reward-based program. There's no doubt about it. Read 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Read 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. There, there's plenty of them, right? About the accountability of a man. But moreover, in stewards, these guys here, they must be found faithful, and so being faithful, and, and, and if you want somebody to listen to what you have to say, what do you really need to be? You need to be straightforward. There, there's no hide in the ball. There's no, ooh, I'm trying to, trying to you know, get these guys to like me by doing this externalism, right? If you do that, guess what? You're, you're not going to receive your reward. You're not going to have that abundant entry into the kingdom. So that's why he says right here, he says in verse number 19, these rewards, you want them? You excited about them? You, you, you think you're a little bit you know, pumped up? All right. Well, here's the deal. Start treasuring them up now. Right? Start investing. Investing where? Investing in the rewards. How do, I, how do I invest in these rewards? I want them. If you want that abundant entry into the kingdom, right? That shall be ministered unto you, right? You're not going to just go like this. Oh, sweet. My trust fund's ready. Ah, finally. Perfect. All right, I'll start taking my draws now, right? No. This is when somebody pays you freely. My 401k's matured. Okay, start raining down the money on me. <laughs> Definitely not. He says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, right? If, you, if, you, if that's your mindset, we got a problem, right? If your mindset's on laying up the treasures on earth, well, you, you sure aren't going to be a good steward of this ministry because there's no money in it. I actually tell you that if you have two coats, to, to get rid of them. If I, I tell you if you have money, just you don't even need it. Don't worry about it. Just get rid of it, right? So this ministry that, that, is, that is seen here in Matthew chapter number 6, I just want people to be honest with it. I just want you to sit there, and if you, if you claim to be a believer in Christ, if you claim to be a Christian, come back here and read Matthew chapter number 6 and start being truthful in how you handle it, right? These are great passages. Paul talks about the same thing in Colossians chapter number 3, right? The same kind of thing, right? Remember what he says in there? If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, right? Same kind of concept, same philosophy, a little bit different, you know, method of operation, but overall very similar. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Why? Because moth's going to be here, but not only that, hey, the tribulation's coming, and dude, you ain't got any time to keep any of this together. Moth doth corrupt, thieves break through and steal. But here's the, here's the thing. Here's your investment. He says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Start investing now in, in the heaven. You can, you can start doing it now. How do I do that? Do what I just told you. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach men, so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So when they get to that point, are they supposed to teach all nations? Well, yeah. Are they supposed to be a light to the Gentiles, to them that sit in darkness? Well, yeah. Do they do that? No. They don't. And when you study out the rest of Scripture, you see that they never, they never do that. They never get there. They never, they never do what they're supposed to do in relation to the, that ministry. 
When you finish out this verse, it says, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. Now notice this. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Well, clearly. Why? Well, if your treasure is, is built up in heaven, that's where your motivation's been. You've been trying to do what? You've been trying to please the Father which is in heaven who sees in secret and that you're ultimately looking for that payday that he'll reward you openly in that, right? It's, it's as, as it's always been said, it's living life with an eternal perspective. It's, it's easy to be short-sighted because what, what do we mostly do, right? Well, we got food. We got some money. All right, cool. We're good. We're done. That's it. We won't do any extra work because man is inherently lazy. It's true. You know as well as I do that if you won the lottery tomorrow, <laughs> you quit your job, you'd be like, hmm, 900-inch TV? Sure, sounds great, you know? Uh, Netflix times four? Perfect, right? You, you'd be doing everything to be as, bo you know, as, as just lazy as you can. Roomba for every room in the house? Why not, right? Anything that's going to make your life easy because man is inherently lazy. So the work, that's why I like to say that the, the work of the ministry is important just as it is you know now as it is back then. And that's why this verse here, he says, for where your, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also because why? Look what he says. The light of the body is the eye. That is the understanding of what is taking place with your body. The direction is your eye, right? So if you're walking around and you don't have eyes, are you in trouble? Well, yeah, what are you going to do? You're going to be blind. You're going to fall into a ditch, right? You're going to be blind and you're going to get hit by a car. You're going to be blind and you can't drive. You're going to be in trouble, right? So that's why it says, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. That is a single peace or focus make sense the whole thing he ends with is you can't serve god and mammon right so the eye is single it's set on a mark it's set on a focus point it knows what it needs it knows what it's supposed to be doing and it operates in that manner but if thine eye be evil that's the other way of saying it's looking after what love of money which is the root of all evil notice it's not money itself working is not bad making lots of money is not bad either there's no doubt about that the end of the book, Paul says in, in 2 Timothy, he says, them that be rich in this world, right? Tell them and command them not to trust in uncertain riches. He doesn't say, them that are rich in this world, tell those idiots to get rid of all their money because they're dumb. They shouldn't have been rich. Dumb rich guys. No, he says, them that are rich in this world, tell them what? Tell them not to trust in uncertain riches, but to trust in God. So when you read here, with I be evil, that's not single. That means it's doing what? Really, your eye is evil. You're, you're laying up treasures upon earth. You're, your eye has got a different motivation. Look, the, the, the business world is cutthroat. Anybody that works in it knows it, right? Lying, cheating, stealing, it's a daily occurrence, you know? Every day. It's what it's all about. It's just about getting ahead any way you possibly can. You know, Scott works in the food industry. I'm sure those guys are like, yeah, that, that food's got to last another two more weeks. And this thing here's got to do this. They're trying to squeeze every dollar, every dime. How can we make some more money? Well, what we'll do is we'll cut off happy hour at 645. And if we do that, everybody think it goes to seven. Well, oh, nope, sorry, it didn't go to seven. And even if we charge four guys extra drink, that's another $100. You know, they, they have all these concoctions because what they're trying to do is they're trying to screw everybody. Trying to make more money, trying to make another dollar, right? Making an honest living, good luck. <laughs> you know, that's the old joke. Making an honest living, you you, you don't make a living. Business world is, is cutthroat. So he says, But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? See, <laughs> so that's not a good thing. You don't want to be sitting in darkness. Darkness is also always likened to what? Lack of knowledge, right? Not un misunderstanding, uh, being dumb, being being ignorant, not not understanding what is happening. That's why he says in verse number twenty-four. This is this is why people are like, oh, twenty-two and twenty-three, difficult verses. Not really when you read verse twenty-four, because no man can serve two masters. What's the two masters? Either your eye is single, it's focused on the light, it's focused on the ministry, it's focused on what it needs to be doing. Yes, you have your sub stuff, and then your other part is no, my my eye is evil, and it does what? He says, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. 
Now, the ultimate question is this. Well, Jesus, you just don't get it. You know, you just don't understand how it works. I'm a Jew, okay? And I got a lot of money, and I got a lot of stuff I'm doing right now here in Jerusalem, and you just don't get it. If I don't worry about my money, I'm not going to eat, I'm not going to have any clothes, I'm going to die. And that's why Christ says, therefore I say unto you, take no what? Take no thought. And that's what we'll pick up next week. We'll, we'll talk about the take no thought. That's, that's the battle for the mind. That's what, he's, that's what he's getting ready to argue. He's like, here's how it works. Either believe me what I tell you, or you don't. And if you, if, you, if you do believe me, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall wear. Don't worry about any of that stuff, what you should drink, what you should put on. Don't worry about any of that. And he's going to give them some real world examples that should hopefully help them and, uh, to do what? To ultimately have faith. That's why he ends that passage with, oh, ye of little faith, right? So we'll pick up next week. We are 35 minutes in. My mom listened to one of my sermons this past week. She goes, oh, I started playing one of your sermons. I said, yeah? She goes, yeah. And I got like 30 minutes in, and I looked at it, and I still had another 30 minutes to go. And I'm like, and? She's like, I just couldn't listen to it anymore. And I said, thanks, Mom. <laughs> She's like, I listened to another one, and I got 12 minutes in, and then I saw it, and it was 57 minutes, and I was like, huh. I said, well, maybe I'll start to shorten them. So here's 38 minutes, 36 minutes, and something odd seconds. So I hope that's been helpful. All right.